Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? Not long ago, we took a fresh look at audio cassettes. This time though, I wanna check out a format that I was always interested in, but never got the opportunity to experience. Well, until now. This is a Sony TCD D7 portable DAT or digital audio tape recorder. It looks like a standard cassette Walkman and it's even branded as a Walkman. It was actually the first of just a few models that Sony made like this, but the DAT format was very different than compact cassette in quite a few ways. On the top is, of course, the typical complement of transport controls. This is a tape device after all. And then some additional buttons up top here for dealing with the clock and the tape counter. The headphone volume control is digital on the front instead of a dial. Here's the combined hold switch and open for the lid. And then this switch is a little confusing at first. In the left position, it takes the headphone output and enables AVLS or automatic volume limiting system. Basically, it just keeps you from turning the volume up so high that you damage your hearing. In the middle where it says off, that's just normal headphone output. And then to the right, it actually takes the headphone jack and turns it into a line output. The other switch on the front over here is a little bit interesting. SP versus LP. DAT had a couple of different play modes. SP standard play is your full quality 44.1 kilohertz signal, but you could get extra runtime by switching it over to LP, in which case it dumped it down to 32 kilohertz. Obviously, whoever had this deck previously, I got this one used not too long ago, really wanted people to only use the SP setting so there's a piece of tape covering the switch so that you can't slide it over to LP mode. Most of the IO is on the right side. You've got the headphone slash line output jack over here, along with a record level wheel. This one is really interesting in that it is very smooth to operate. It doesn't feel cheap at all. It's got a nice amount of resistance to it, so it's not gonna be terribly easy to bump out of place. Plus it's got kind of a rubber band around the outside of it to make it really easy to grip. In the middle is this multi-way switch that I think the same person kind of put this rubber bumper thing on, again, to make sure that it stays in the position they wanted it to. It's basically kind of the auto level adjustment stuff. So you can set it to manual mode, in which case then you, you know, can control everything directly on your own, or you can set it to auto between music and speech where it just kind of does an auto gain control type of thing. Three and a half millimeter line input jack, that's analog. Three and a half millimeter stereo microphone jack, and this one has plug-in power, AKA bias power for condenser, like small condenser microphones. And then a mic sensitivity switch. You can think of this as being kind of like the preamplifier gain where you can set it between low and high. The only port on the back is for the AC adapter, six volts DC input, no big deal. And then on the left side, the only thing that's really interesting is this remote and digital I.O. port. This is a multifunction port. Unfortunately, it's proprietary, but it's where you can get digital audio input and output through this unit, plus remote control kind of functions. And we'll talk about the digital audio portion in a little bit. Something I really like about this unit is the LCD screen. It's kind of hard to come across on camera, but it looks really, really high quality and it's very sharp. And another really nice thing about it is that it's backlit through an electroluminescent panel. Overall, the build quality of this unit is very high. It's heavy, even without any batteries in it. The outside trim like here is made out of plastic as is the battery bay cover, but the top and bottom panels are actually made out of metal. And what's really interesting is they have this glossy painted surface that's got a bit of a metallic sheen to it 
almost like automotive paint. It just gives this thing a very high quality feel. This is certainly not meant to have been a cheap consumer device back when it was new. This was for someone who knew what they were doing with it and wanted to pay a little bit more for the extra quality. It's just a really nice solid unit. And there's one feature this thing actually lacks that really kind of reinforces that this was not meant for average consumer like listening to music use. And that is there is no switch to turn on Mega Bass. Now, after I got my hands on this unit, I wanted to experience recording some audio through it. So I went out and picked up some new old stock blank tapes. I could record to this thing through that line in on the side in an analog way, but where's the fun in that? The whole point behind this format was that it was digital and it records in very high quality. It's literally as good as CD quality sound, 44.1 kilohertz, 16 bit. So I need to use that interface on the side, the proprietary one. Well, there's some catches around that that we'll get into, but what I also needed was to get actual audio into this thing. Now, DAT used the SP diff or Sony Philips digital interface format standard for digital audio. That's a consumer grade standard that also got used for a whole bunch of other kinds of equipment. Minidisc used it, CD players often had an output for it. You also frequently would see it out of DVD players and into home theater receivers because there was enough bandwidth within SP diff as a standard to handle multi-channel compressed audio, but it also did two-channel uncompressed audio. So you could basically do perfect digital copies if you had the right equipment and cable. So I'd like to take a little bit of a side quest, if that's okay, and talk about SP diff. It's gonna be easier using a DVD slash CD player for this one. It's just what I have on hand. Um, and well, let's take a bit of a deep dive into how that whole protocol works, shall we? So SPDIF is based on another protocol called AES. Uh, AES is kind of a professional version of the digital audio protocol and SPDIF is the consumer one. And there are actually some striking similarities between the two, uh, but there are some differences still. So let's get the scope hooked up here and we can take a look at what the signal looks like and potentially what some of those differences are. So to start, let me get a, uh, a CD playing here. That'll give us some signal to uh, examine. So I've got the CD stopped right now and took a quick single shot capture of the digital coaxial output from this player with my oscilloscope and you can see it's a nice square wave here. Now, what's interesting about SPDIF and AES is if you notice the peaks and valleys on this wave are always at the same heights, right? In this case, it's a nice even wave because it's just kind of the, I don't know what they call it, like the carrier signal, just kind of the standard signal that SPDIF always sends, regardless of whether it's passing audio or not. I guess just to signify that there is a signal there to a receiving device so that it knows it's picking something up from the source. But because the peaks and valleys are always at the same amplitude, that means this signal is technically frequency modulated or FM. And that becomes a lot more apparent if I press play on the CD player and then do another single capture here. Notice how some of these are wider than others. And I'll do another single shot. You can see the signal keeps changing because the audio is playing right now. And so that's how SPDIF and AES works is it, instead of figuring out like the difference in voltage between like a low voltage signal and a high voltage signal, like some systems do, 
Instead, it does it based on the length of each pulse, basically. And what's really interesting is where the differences, kind of the fundamental differences between SPDIF and AES come into play. They both use the same like signaling protocol where they both work the same way like this, and they both encode audio in the same way, but there's kind of a fundamental difference in the actual like hardware level part of it. Obviously there's an amplitude to this wave. SPDIF uses much lower signal strengths than AES does. The AES standard I'd like to say is something like five volts. Whereas SPDIF is an order of magnitude smaller. It's like half a volt. And in fact, if I go into the cursor view here and start following this waveform, you can see at its peak, it's right around 500 millivolts or so at the top. And then of course we can follow it down to the bottom. And it's, you know, kind of right around that same 500, negative 500 millivolts. What's curious is obviously there was intentionally made a big difference between SPDIF and AES from this voltage standard, right? My guess is it's to keep people from using one with the other. A professional AES based recorder with a consumer based playback device, something like that. So the voltages were intentionally made different. I'm sure there were other reasons as well, but what's curious that I've found, at least with this particular DAT recorder, is, well, sometimes the tolerances are so loose, they work fine anyway. Let me give you an example. What's interesting about this particular recorder is it's, you know, like a prosumer kind of grade piece of equipment, and it specifically says it supports SPDIF. Yet what's weird about it is the specifications say that the voltage required on the digital coax, like, you know, copper input is like five volts, not 0.5 volts like the SPDIF standard requires. Accessories for DAT can be very expensive these days to the point where this unit requires a proprietary cable for digital audio input and output. They were, you know, available back when this unit was new for a reasonable price, but obviously not as many people bought them. And because they're cables, they start to kind of get lost with time. So they're becoming scarce. Digital audio cables for at least the TCD D7 and D8 like this can go for over a hundred dollars on eBay. Obviously I don't want to drop that kind of money just on an experiment like this. So I went out and made my own. I found the pinout on a website and I created this cable. It's a bunch of like jumper leads that I kind of all hacked together into the correct pin arrangement to go into the port on the side. I used some Sugru to kind of hold all the ends together in just the right like arrangement. So this only took me, you know, a, maybe a couple hours to make and not very much money. And then as I was getting ready to use this for testing, I took a look online one more time. And of course I found this for all of 40 bucks. Uh, so I snatched it up. This is the legit cable. It was brand new in package. I wasn't expecting that to be the case. Um, but this is what you would have bought back then if you wanted to use digital audio in on one of these portable DAT recorders. What's also interesting is on the end of the connector here, there's a switch between digital and analog. All that does when you switch it to analog is it basically kind of turns this cable off. Um, the recorder detects the presence of this cable by seeing two pins shorted together, like on this connector. And so by sliding the switch to analog, it like unshorts those two pins so that the recorder basically doesn't think the cable's attached anymore. So let me put the recorder into 
record arm mode. It's not actually rolling, but it's going to start accepting level input. And then let me hit play on the player and check this out. Yeah, I'm getting signal. And that's what's really kind of confusing and a little bit frustrating about these DAT recorders is even though they say they need 5 volts input, just like AES, they'll accept actually a pretty wide range of inputs. And I should note, the cable I'm using is what they call a passive cable. It's literally just taking the signal coming out of my DVD player here and putting it directly into this deck. There were so-called active cables you could buy, yet, well, people figured out that it just works anyway. I don't know if that was intentional on Sony's part, if they just published that spec as being more like AES, but it turns out they, you know, secretly said, yeah, you know, it'll work just fine anyway, or if that's just some strange byproduct of the parts that they used inside this unit, turns out, well, they can handle a much wider range of voltages than anyone otherwise expected. So I'm actually recording from CD onto DAT now. One really cool feature that SPDIF offered. Well, you'll see it. This track is about to end and the next song will begin. Watch what happens when we roll between tracks. You'll notice it on this corner of the display. Yeah, it added a new track marker. That happens automatically when you record from a digital source. And that's something that's really cool because it makes for much less hands-on recording when you needed to do this sort of thing, go from one source to another, especially if that source happened to be compact disc. Now, one bummer about recording digitally like this is while you get the track markers, it won't automatically stop on its own. So I have to keep an eye on the display of the optical player here to uh, know when the track, you know, the whole album or whatever is about to end so I can manually press stop on the recorder. We're coming up on it right about now. There we go. And so, yeah, that was overall pretty painless otherwise, um, at least far less painful than recording to something like cassette, partially because when recording through the digital interface, of course, you don't have to worry about setting levels. Since you're recording digitally, you can't go past zero on the meters, right? Like cassette, you could record into the red, as they called it. With any form of digital recording, as soon as you go past zero, you're well into distortion territory. What's nice about recording digitally, though, is it's just one set level. So that volume, you know, gain whatever recording knob on the side has absolutely no effect when you're recording digitally through this thing. It's just one less thing to worry about. Something else that's really nice about DAT is even though it's a linear format and it's tape and you have to fast forward and rewind and stuff, those track markers make it really easy to skip between songs, of course, but one thing that I noticed the first time I recorded a tape on this was just how quick it was to rewind. I'm at the end of this recording, a little over 35 minutes worth. Let me hit rewind and you can see just how fast it is to get back to the beginning. That has to do, of course, with how DAT records. And we'll take a peek inside this machine in a minute. But because of the way it records, DAT goes way slower in terms of tape speed. DAT goes at something like a little over 8 millimeters per second through just normal play. And we're done already. 35 minutes of audio, and that was just, what, a few seconds? So, 8 millimeters or so per second normal play speed. Compare that to cassettes. Cassettes are almost 48 millimeters per second, something like that, during normal play. What all that means, ultimately, is that DAT tapes physically don't need 
as much tape in them, right? And so that, of course, is partially why they're physically so much smaller. But because they need less physical tape, because they don't have to travel as far to record, you know, the same amount of audio, it means that fast forward and rewinding is just so much ridiculously faster. And that's one I think of the major pain points of cassette is just how long it takes to, you know, get anywhere on the tape. Now, at least when recording digitally, DAT produces bit perfect copies from its source, meaning there's no like compression or anything going on with the audio. So unlike with other formats such as DCC, DAT gives you just the same ones and zeros that you feed into it are what gets written to tape. So how was DAT able to record at such a slow rate? Well, it all has to do with how the data was written to the tapes. And it all comes down to the mechanism inside. Most tape formats broke the audio into channels and wrote it in a linear fashion down the length of the tape. The heads in the decks were stationary and so they simply picked up or recorded audio as the tape slid past. Thus, there was a direct correlation between tape speed and audio quality. DAT did things a bit differently though. The audio was written to the tape in diagonal segments and this had the net benefit of being a much more efficient use of tape. They simply were able to take advantage of more surface area and thus lower the tape speed. The mechanism inside a DAT deck may look a bit familiar. That's because they're based around how video cassettes work. The head in the back is cylindrical and spun around, also set at an angle. So every rotation completed what was called a helical scan of the tape, basically read each one of those segments. The other really nice thing about DAT, they're single-sided. There is no such thing as needing to flip a DAT tape from one side to the other, unlike cassettes. You could get DAT tapes up to, I believe, 180 minutes in length. The practical maximum I think that most people used was about 120 minute tapes, but they, of course, came in a variety of lengths. But just think about that. Up to 180 minutes of CD quality audio in a cartridge that size that you don't need to flip. So if that was such a like technically awesome format, why did it ultimately not really gain any traction with consumers? Well, there are two main reasons for that as far as I can tell. The first has to do with the fact that it can record perfect digital copies. That got the music industry's attention and caused them to freak out a little bit. If you may remember back in kind of the 80s, there was that whole campaign against people recording music on their own from other sources. The whole, you know, so-called home taping is killing music kind of hand waving and all that that the industry wanted to, to do. When the music labels caught wind that Sony had developed a format that could create perfect digital copies, basically it collectively lost its shit and went after Sony to prevent this product from really gaining any traction. The floodgates are about to open with no resolution of the royalty issue, which has alarmed songwriters and other creative artists. We're very afraid of uh, the possibility of cottage industry because the copying will be so accurate. The fidelity would be, well, actually, it's a clone. It's not a copy. It's exactly like the original compact disc. Sony was hoping that DAT would have taken over basically for cassette. It was a technically superior format. And so, of course, it wanted to offer pre-recorded music on DAT. Well, because of the music label's resistance to this format, more or less that never happened. A few pre-recorded titles did make it out, but nowhere near as many is whatever came out on cassette or CD or hell, even mini disc. The other thing that really kind of killed it for consumers was the cost. Obviously, these were not cheap. And while Sony really tried, it came out with a full product line of DAT-based products, portable units like this, home decks. 
Sony even made car decks that could play DAT tapes. Well, the cost was high, and the mechanisms weren't as reliable as they could be. In fact, even this unit, which generally works very well, periodically when I put a tape in it, it'll fail to load. And that's a very, very common error, especially with this particular model. It was supposedly corrected in the successor to this one called the D8, or at least it happens less often. And then there's also the simple fact that, well, cassette was good enough for the average consumer back then. Only the diehards really wanted to go for DAT, and not very many of them even did. Now, did DAT completely fail? No, absolutely not. While it didn't go over very well with consumers, DAT went over wonderfully with audio professionals, and it found two primary use cases in the pro audio field. The first had to do with basically like what this particular deck was designed for, and that was field recording. A few different use cases for this. One was, of course, portable music recording. Maybe you're in a band and you want to get a high quality recording of one of your gigs. Or maybe you're a journalist and you work for a radio station and you want to go out in the field and interview people. Hence the microphone input on the side. This gives you really high quality and, of course, long run time with the presence of things like, you know, 120 plus minute tapes. Also, DAT found a pretty decent following with audio for video professionals, basically audio engineers who worked on movie and television production. The other use case that DAT saw was in recording studios not necessarily as part of the recording an album process like multi-track or anything like that, but at the tail end of it. Mastering engineers would take the final album after it had been recorded and mixed and EQ'd and all of the other steps that go into producing a studio album. Well, they needed a way to get that audio to the production plant to manufacture things like CDs. When CDs were new, the most common way to do that was actually using U-Matic video cassettes. Sony manufactured what was called a PCM adapter, and now we would just refer to it as an analog to digital converter that allowed for the storage of audio, digital audio, basically onto U-Matic cassettes. That was clunky at best and required Increasingly aging equipment by the late 80s when DAT came out, U-Matic had long since kind of died off as a primary video storage format even. And so studios really took to DAT because it fulfilled that need. Throughout the 90s, when it was sent to that pressing plant, there's a very, very good chance it was recorded to DAT to make that journey. So ultimately, what happened to DAT? Well, in the professional world, it ultimately kind of died out around 2005 when Sony more or less killed the format. On the consumer side, of course, this thing was more or less DOA, so consumer products, consumer decks had long since been discontinued. We're at the point now where there's really nothing new being produced for DAT. Obviously, the equipment has long since stopped being manufactured, but you can't even buy brand new tapes anymore that have been freshly manufactured. Everything, all of these sealed tapes that I have here were purchased new old stock off of eBay. So these numbers are definitely dwindling. Does that mean that the hardware is really cheap and this format's easy to get into? Well, no, actually quite the opposite, unfortunately. On the consumer side of things, since there just wasn't that much equipment that had been manufactured, it's kind of rare and so it's commanding a price premium. On the professional side of things, likewise, because it was such a staple and the equipment isn't being made anymore, there's a ton of DAT tapes around, like masters and interviews and all of this kind of archival stuff that people still want to be able to pull off the tape and play back. So the retro equipment from the professional side is also commanding a bit of a price premium. Now, I was lucky and got this particular deck for free. It was headed out for recycling. But 
Even though it generally works fine, it has that occasional loading fault, I decided I wanted to pick up a parts unit just in case this one had problems. So I bought this one, an identical unit. It has more problems than this one. It basically just dies as soon as you press play, like it completely powers off. I suspect there's something going on with the circuit board in it. But even known bad, sold as parts, this thing cost me like 70 bucks. A good one of these that exhibits zero faults is gonna be well over 100. So, sad to say, while this is a super cool format, it's tough for a lot of people to wanna to get into. And will we ever see a resurgence in DAT, especially on the consumer side, like we have with vinyl and cassettes? Absolutely not. Just the scarcity of the hardware and the expensive blank tapes is pretty much gonna kill that. In any event though, better late than never, I'm so glad that I finally got to check out this format. I think it's so good and it's a great glimpse of what the future could have held. It's just a bummer it took me a couple of decades to get there. Anyway, if you liked the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.